Okay. Thank you so much, Angela, for having me, for having me be a part of this incredible show of women that I really admire and respect and making the effort to have a show for me. So I wanted to show you all um, my technique that I work in because I think that that it's an interesting one and I thought I'd show you how I like to work in the studio in formal gear. Don't all you ladies out there work in formal gear <laughs> when you make your artwork? So I just thought I would start with the technique because um, I think that it's, it's an, well, it is an unusual process. It was developed in the late 70s. Uh, the technique is based on an ancient bronze casting method that's been around for thousands of years and um, was developed in glass in the late 70s, early 80s, which is when I learned it. So I wanted to start off by showing you how I make um, the artwork. The artwork starts with a sketch. Then it goes to a mold making process where you get the positive and that could be made of clay or wood or styrofoam. And in this particular instance, you see the sketches of the horse there and then the clay horse being molded. And that's gonna be my stamp or my positive. And then you make this rubber mold over the clay and then you pour in the plaster so you get this very hard material to stamp the shape into the sand that I use. Now the sand is actually not sta sand, it's ground up semi-precious stone. It's um, peridot, which is a green semi-precious stone that's ground up into this sand-like substance. I add a little bit of moisture, I add a little bit of clay, and then I press that shape into the sand. So it's, it's not dry beach sand, but it's got moisture and clay so that it'll hold the form that you press into it. I pack the sand around the shape, um, and then I take the shape out, and you could see it taken out of the mold there and left on the side. And then the reason why it's black there is because I use a gas called acetylene gas that coats the sand and it acts as a releasing agent so that when you pour the molten glass in into the mold, the sand doesn't cake on and stick. So that's like, I, I use the example of, of grease or butter in your pan when you make eggs, the eggs won't stick to the pan. So it's similar in that um, there's a layer there between the molten glass and the sand. So in this um, picture, you see I'm holding a lavender glass, which um, is a glass that I melted down. So the whole day I was pouring that color, but typically I work in clear glass. And the way that I color the pieces is I add powdered glass to the bottom of the mold there. So here I'm showing you the bags of powdered glass that I sprinkle right onto the sand to give the surface color. So the glass is clear and then the color is resting on the surface. So that is how most of the pieces in the past were colored. I'd say 10 years ago, I started melting down these solid colors that I was recycling and, um, and that glass is a little bit more dense and rich. Um, I'm also showing you some important tools that I use. Um, the vacuum is, is a really important tool in the studio where I you know, clean the mold. If sand falls into it, I suck it out and I have you know, very narrow tips to get out in very you know, small crevices, the sand so that uh, the mold is as perfect as possible. And then in my other hand, you see a spoon and a little screen so that when I, you know, take the powdered glass, I sift it through the screen so that I can control where the color goes on the sand. 
And then when the mold is ready to go, I'm pouring the molten glass into that void, into that negative. So some molds are small and take one ladle. Some molds can be super large and be 11 ladles. And you have to really scoop and pour as fast as you can because that first ladle is cooling by the time the second ladle is poured and the third ladle. So we have torches there to keep the glass warm, um, which sounds kind of <laughs> funny because it is 2000 degrees Fahrenheit, but the reality is that first ladle is cooling and it's gonna cool fast. So you have to have torches to keep the glass a uniform temperature as you're ladling or else you'll have breakage. So here is the horse after it was poured. I used this specialty red glass that created these beautiful patterns, which I wanted to show you. The mold uh, was fill filled up. That took about two ladles to fill that mold. Here is um, one of my latest bodies of work, the talking heads. And that's one of the heads, Angela has one. And the torch that I'm holding there is, is my hot torch. It is so hot that it will reliquify the glass. So it is important because as I told you, if there's a 10 ladle piece, that first ladle and the 10th ladle is a very different temperature. So that torch is so hot that, you know, I will be able to get all of the glass a uniform temperature. So that's my hot torch, very important tool in this process. And then we cut it out of the mold. You can see that's a horse and it's being put into this cooling oven, which is called an, an annealer. And my cycle, since they're so thick, my work takes about a week. It's a hundred hour cycle to cool back to room temperature, as opposed to glass blowing where it's thin, you know, that might take a day or less. So my cycle is about a week to cool back to room temperature. You can't peek, can't look and see, oh, did it come out? That would crack it. So that's basically this technique. Um, metal, you know, I'd say the, the big difference between metal casting and this technique is the metal can just cool in the sand, right in the air. You don't have to slowly cool it. So that would be the big difference between the two techniques. So just to reiterate, it's a stamp and a pour technique. So on the left, you'll see my, my stamp, my food ahead there. And then I poured the glass into that mold. That was about 11 ladles. It was, it's massive, massive wow. food ahead. And um, you can see here, it, it finished in a garden um, in Palm Beach. That's so daylight, nightlight, and um, it was the biggest single casting I've ever done that head it cooled for many weeks it wasn't just one week because it was so big so here was um, me learning how to glass blow um, I started immediately to have really really good response from the teachers every everyone just seemed to really like what I was doing I felt like I was onto something and so I thought okay I'm gonna go and go around New Orleans and see what the professionals think of my work. And, you know, I never in a million years thought I'd get anything other than a critique. But um, I ended up getting uh, a solo show while I was a senior um, at, was Sophie Newcomb, but Tulane. And uh, it was, it was just a dream come <laughs> true to have, you know, a gallery be interested enough to show my work and you know, we had a fantastic show. Um, we sold everything, I think, and got a wonderful write-up from Roger Green, who I was told was pretty tough. And, um, but he really loved the show, and I felt like I found my calling. You know, here it is. Now, I did find this piece in my warehouse with about two inches of dust. This was from Tulane super raw you know just very very direct i was was doing a lot of masks back then i was inspired by what i was seeing the mardi gras um you know there was just so much incredible culture there and i was studying in art history all the great masters who were inspired by african art and so i was looking a lot at african art and masks and the concept of, of 
what a mask is. And um, so this was done back then. I was doing ceramics and I, I made this mold out of clay. Um, a lot of this talk, I'm now gonna go into a lot of the pieces in place because I feel like it's nice to see where they end up and the homes that where they end up is really nice. Uh, today, I'm still riding. I'm still fascinated by horses. Um, Angela has a horse in her gallery. It, it took me about 20 years to work up the courage to, to create this incredible animal that I'm so fond of. So um, I tried to really break the horse down into simplicity and um, was inspired by cave drawings. And so I broke it down, you know, as much as I could to these cave drawings, but it definitely has um, some depth to it. I had to get the idea out. I was just like, I just have to do it. I can't think about it another minute. I just have to make something. So this is new work through these horses. Very, very important to me, my love of them. And then kimonos, I was, uh, I've been doing here for a little while. And so this is outdoors. My work can go outdoors, surprisingly. It's thick and it's durable. And so I wanted to show you that, that even though it's glass, it still can handle the elements and can handle animals. And then this piece was um, in front of the Museum of Fine Arts in St. Petersburg for the 50 year celebration of the studio glass movement. So this was really an exciting project, you know. And then I wanted to show you, uh, this one is in a corporate office. These bells are inspired by Han Dynasty bronze bells, but mine are definitely silent. <laughs> And these bells were kind of a fun project because it's in a, if you can see it, it's in a wine cellar. And so I do, you know, I customize, I can customize the pieces so that they fit in a space. My husband who works with me, we work very closely together. He was an architect. And um, so he, he can superimpose a concept in a space with just a picture, with just a snapshot. And then we can look at, you know, proportions and see if it works. It really is helpful to take the guesswork out. This was an interesting placement. This is this Depression era glass. It's Vaseline glass, um, it's called. It was popular between 1840 and 1940 with the aristocrats and royalty of the time. It has a little bit of uranium dioxide, so it glows under a black light. And Angela actually has a piece um, an African sort of a head that is made from this Vaseline glass, but it actually has a little bit of uranium dioxide in it, so it glows under a black light, and it's lit at night with this black light. And I'm told that you can see this um, from the Ben Franklin Bridge in Philadelphia. You can see this glowing in the distance. <laughs> and then I just wanted to finish off the talk by showing you the pieces that Angela has. This is a, a really small Buddha, but Nevertheless, but quite impactful. It's only 14 inches tall. And here's a, a much taller Buddha that is 50 inches tall, made of this special gold glass. I come upon these um, these glasses glass that I recycle, and I have you know I really don't know much about them or their history or how many times they've been melted and. You know, sometimes you get a color like this one that was so difficult. Like I, I really, my, my success rate is pretty high, but with this color, we hardly got any pieces to come out. But this is one that did came, come out and I just absolutely love this color. It's so rich. And then these are some more abstract bodies of work that I do as well. I love to break things down, as I said, to simplicities. So this is simple line, doesn't get simpler than that. Very difficult pieces to, to, to make. This, this is bringing back to my painting love because I literally lay that ground up glass that I showed you in the bags. It's kind of the consistency of sugars. And I take a spoon 
and I lay it across the sand. And then I take my finger and I pre embed it slightly in the sand. Then I do the next line. <laughs> so it is very labor intensive, but it's fun. It's just, it feels like painting and it's, it's intimate and it's just me and you know, the, the work, um, which changes dramatically once we start pouring. And then this one Angela has as well. It's a very serene one. This is a new Buddha head that I've made. Different size, a little bit smaller than life size. And this one is my, um, call it my O, and I like to evoke different cultures, cross, you know, cultural um, imagery, like the, the horizontal part is um, inspired from a, a rest for a king to put his headdress on when he sleeps. And then the, the ring is eternal. And so, and then those metal squares are copper. Anytime you see metal embedded in the glass, it's a form of copper. It's one of the few metals that won't cause the glass to crack. They, it just expands and contracts at the same rate that glass does. So whenever you see metal embedded in, in the glass, it'll be some kind of copper that I've found and used. I think these were roofing nails. <laughs> they turn this beautiful color, this charcoal color in the process, which I love. You can see a little bit of the orange, but it's mostly gray. Oh, and the other thing about this um, piece is that it, it's hovering above that stand. It's floating, it looks like it's floating, which I'm um, excited about this presentation, it's new. And then I have this dragonfly. And this Buddha as well is, um, I love that um, it's a metallic color and often it'll just be an amber color. But in this instance, you see these, the beautiful turquoises and that came out because of the heat combining with the oxygen. And sometimes the metals come out like this, sometimes not. So you just don't know what you're gonna get. And this was the one I was telling you about, the, the Vaseline glass, that's depression era glass that, that I used for the face, that I used in the face. So that will glow under a black light. But what's interesting about Vaseline glass is that it actually, it feels like it sucks in light. So at the end of the day, it will look glowing. Even though it's not under black light, it will just, I don't know, it's just fascinating glass. I don't know why it does that. And then I use porcupine quills as sort of the hair or the headdress there. Went to Africa, my husband is from there. And so we visited and I saw these porcupine quills and I just thought they were so beautiful. It had to be in a sculpture somehow. And then this one is made, this is also an unusual glass and it's, it's got neodymium in it, which is an element and it's two-toned it's really fascinating it's it right now you can actually see both colors in this picture but sometimes it'll be lavender and sometimes it'll be periwinkle so depending on the light it'll be either lavender or periwinkle so it's really unusual so this is uh the last slide and it's my latest body of work i call the talking heads and they're about relationships uh, they started out being about uh, my husband and I have been together 27 years and, you know, we're so different, but yet we get along. And then just with what's going on today, I just started thinking about, you know, that just have to do with so many conversations, you know, race and culture and, you know, so it's, but we're just people at the end of the day, and you know, we might have differences, but we do have a lot in common. So these are the conversations that these sculptures are having. <laughs> and um, so they're different, but yet they're still having the conversation. So the way that the metal stands come about to complete the piece 
is sometimes the designs are done prior to actually the hot studio. Like I know exactly how the metal stand is going to frame the piece. And sometimes it occurs after the piece has been cast and comes out of the oven. And with, with the steel, you know, there is a dialogue between that and the glass. They're two such absolutely opposite materials and to unify them is not easy. And my husband, who was an architect, he helps, we collaborate on the stand design where he will put it in the computer and we can really look at the proportions and he will propose something and then we tweak it and we change you know, the proportions so that it's something that I like but we work very closely together on the metal frames so that they talk to the glass and it's unified as one idea. It's not um, two different concepts that are trying to work together, but hopefully they, they read as one thing and the stand disappears, but yet has its own strong voice. So it has been something that ha has not always been easy for me to unify these glass sculptures with the metal stands, but I feel, you know, since Thomas came on board and we've been working together now for about 10 years, I feel like the stands really have arrived and I'm very happy with the union of the two.